Muy buenas a todos, bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Eh, perdonadme que cambie a inglés porque quiero dar la, la bienvenida a nuestro invitado de hoy. Uh, Warren Spector, welcome to the Fun and Serious Game Festival, or rather, thank you very much for welcoming us to your house because this is a very strange year and we could we couldn't invite you as we would have liked, but at least we can chat in this way. Well, it's great to be here. I, I wish I could be there in person, but uh, this is this is better than nothing, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully next year. Yeah, so that'd be great. We have um, a few minutes. Uh, uh, in front of us to chat, but I, first of all, I have to tackle the elephant in the room. Uh, the pandemic has hit us all. I guess that it has also affected your work and your uh, current projects without going into any details about the actual projects. Uh, how much do you have you been affected by the situation and how have you adapted to it? Well, I, personally, I haven't been affected much at all. I'm I'm a little embarrassed about that because so many people are, are suffering, but realistically, uh, I can do most of my work from home uh, and we get food delivered and, you know, I've got my mask for when I want to go out, but uh, it's it's been a little strange having my entire team working remotely. Uh, but, you know, we use uh, various uh, tools like Zoom and Slack and we're uh, we're doing okay. A little bit of loss of efficiency, but not too much. Nothing too dramatic, right? I guess it's it's strange because everyone in the industry tells me a bit of the same. For um, such a group effort that developing a game is, all the studios I've talked about this uh, in the previous months have told me the same. It was like, well, no, one day we were working from the office and then the next day we were working from home, but nothing changed that much. It's like this industry was somehow prepared for this kind of thing. Well, it, it seems to be the case. The, the one thing that we've really lost is the casual conversations that happen in the hallway and people walking over to other people's desks and looking over their shoulders. That's unfortunate. Um, but other than that, um, you know, engineers pretty much put their heads down and, and do their thing and artists put their heads down and do their thing and designers, uh, you know, work with various tools to uh, put their heads down and do their thing. And, and uh, several times a day we get together virtually uh, to compare notes and make sure that everybody's working on the right things. So uh, I think we are pretty much uh, prepared for it. We were. And it'll be interesting to see if we go back to working in a single office uh, the way we used to. Uh, a lot of people really like the, the freedom of, of being able to work uh, at their own pace and in their own time. So yeah, right. we'll, that's we'll see like what happens um, when this is behind us. That's like an open question for everyone because we are all like um, some of the things that we've been doing these months are probably here to stay. Like next year in this festival, now we can think of something that was unthinkable a few years back and is having remote guests doing their interviews from home. Back a few years ago, that would have been like a downer, but now it seems like a natural thing to do. It seems like the industry will be pretty much like that, right? I assume so, yeah. And, uh, you know, I've, I've done uh, several talks and, and conversations like this this year, uh, always virtually. And I've been able to talk to people and, and virtually see people that I never would have seen, places I never would have been able to visit. Uh, so it's, it's actually worked out pretty well. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I hope we keep doing some of this. I'd, I really want to visit you in person. I yeah. really want to go a lot of, I really want to travel, but uh, this is uh, an interesting way to interact with people and, and useful in a lot of ways. Well, let's get the virus behind us and, and talk about something else, something much more uh, interesting. Um, we, I remember talking with you when you were in the festival a few years back about how you started in games, that the sense of... Um, being able to replicate in some ways the narrative freedom that tabletop games uh, can give you was something that somehow um, drove you to games. Is that the feeling that you were opening a path, that you could create something new that drove you to games? Do you think is that what definitely made the difference back then to decide your career? 
Well, I kind of fell into this career. Uh, I, it's not like I chose it. It wasn't even really a career when I started. You know, like everybody or like many people in this business, I started out playing Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, my uh, my first dungeon master was Bruce Sterling, who was one of the the founders of the cyberpunk movement, which is now obviously, as we all know, coming back. Hmm. Uh, and he was a great storyteller. So uh, my friends and I really got into uh, telling our stories with him uh, just as, as players. And from there, I started tinkering with the rule systems and creating my own rule sets and my own games. Uh, and that landed me a job at Steve Jackson Games, a small game company here in Austin, Texas, where I live. Uh, and um, I got to work on a game called Tune, which scratched a niche for me that, uh, you know, with cartoons, I've always been a, a huge cartoon fan. So I got to do a cartoon role-playing game and went to TSR and um, worked on uh, the second edition of Advanced Dungeons and & Dragons and Top Secret and a variety of other tabletop role-playing games. Um, and then when I... Uh, when I had the opportunity to move into video games, it was with uh, Origin, which at the time was was known for uh, the Ultima games. Ultima series, yeah. Which, yeah, which I had been playing obsessively for a while and which came as close as anything at that time to feeling like D&D. &D. And so that kind of set me off on on my career path. Ever since then, uh, I've I've just been trying to recreate the feeling I had when I played D and D for the first time. Do you just kind of a sad commentary on a career, but there you go. No. <laughs> Do you think after all these years that you have achieved that that original goal? Not even close. <laughs> uh, and until we have some sort of AI driven dungeon master that can really um, change direction and change the, uh, the, the narrative based on what players do, I don't think we'll ever get there. Uh, you know, it, it's unclear to me that we'll ever have AI at that level, but that's what it would take. So I, I just keep trying to take one baby step after another to give players uh, more and more control over their experience um, so they can tell their own stories like we did when, when I was playing D&D. &D. You might have not achieved that in your own words, but uh, you have achieved something else. Uh, ultimately, the, the experience of playing games is different, not, not inferior, different than playing tabletop games. It's uh, a different, uh, um, might be a different goal, but uh, you, if you haven't achieved it, you have opened the path for others to achieve it in the near future, I, I think. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I, I've tried, certainly. And, you know, we've we've certainly come closer and closer over the years as our uh, simulation tools have gotten better. And even as our graphics have gotten better, it's easier to uh, immerse someone in a world and remove barriers to belief that they're actually in that world. Uh, we can simulate uh, a world better, you know, with not just physics, but with... Um, simple systems that interact with one another in interesting ways and interact with the world in interesting ways. We're better at AI now than we used to be. So we can now have worlds that are really responsive to player input. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, the, the big thing is uh, allowing players to show off how clever and creative they are and not sort of for, put in the forefront how clever and creative I am or my teams mm -hmm. are. So, um, we can set up situations and challenges that players can solve the way they want to with, within limits, of course. Yeah. Um, let's, and then let's have a world that responds to that. Into that, because that, that, wha that's what's always been interesting me the most about your games. Uh, you, you call them, and, and it's, it's settled as a, as a genre, uh, immersive sims more than uh, action adventure or whatever they are immersive sims and and the whole point of the genre is that there's a lot of systems overlapping that allow you to as a player direct your experience and do as you say within certain limits do anything you want how do you approach that kind of design is it um you have a general vision of what you want player to experience and then you deduct your way down to the 
systems you have to design, or it's the other way around. You design a little system, put another one overlapping, and then induct your way up to the general uh, experience that can be achieved through your game. Well, I, I, you know, interestingly, uh, I don't start with, with either of those. I, I typically, I mean, different games you, you conceive in different ways, but usually what I do is I start with what fantasy do I want to deliver to the player? Who do I want the player to be? Um, and that leads pretty naturally into what the player can do. What are the verbs of the game? Um, but then you start thinking about what is this world like? Uh, what are our players going to expect to do? What are they going to try to do? Uh, and then you build systems to support that. Um, in, uh, in, in Deus Ex, for example, I started with the idea that the player was going to be um, James Bond, a guy who believes in, in a world that's black and white, but then is thrown into a world that's all shades of gray. But he's still an, an agent of some sort in, in the, the modern world. And, and so that implies, okay, there's going to have to be some element of of uh, combat in the game. There's going to have to be some element of, of uh, stealth in the game. Um, it, to be honest, actually, Deus Ex started out as my response to Thief, a game I, I worked on uh, for about a year. I, I get too much credit for Thief all the time, but <laughs> um, no, I, I was there for the middle year of a three-year development cycle. So I got to see it uh, develop into this wonderful stealth game um, but the team, there, there was one day in particular, the team said, I, I said, I, I'm not good enough at sneaking to get past this part of the game. Let me fight the guy. And they said, no, if we give you enough power to actually fight, that's what everybody will do. If you get, and it's true. If you give a player a gun, they're going to shoot it, right? Um, but I left that that room saying, I'm going to show these guys that I can make a game that allows both shooting and sneaking and build a fantasy around that, that where that makes sense. Um, and then on top of that, let players talk because modern day world, you're an agent. What do you expect to do? And then support as many of the, um, the aspects of, of those verbs as we possibly can. So fight, sneak, talk, combine a bunch of genres. There's, there's actually nothing new in Deus Ex. People don't seem to realize that. It's a little bit of a role-playing game. It's a little bit of a stealth game. It's a little bit of a, of a first-person shooter jammed all together uh, in this, this stew that ended up tasting like, like nothing players had played before. But there's, there's really nothing new in there. I took all sorts of stuff from other genres and, and just mashed them together. So that, 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 I'm not sure that answered your question. No, no, actually. yeah, it does, but it, it opens to any question. The, the, there goes my script. Uh, just a second. <laughs> this will be better. Go for it. Yeah, uh, th that, that drove, drove me to another question. Uh, the approach you explain is quite different than what most game designers told me about how they work, because they usually say, no, you, you start from a mechanic. You start from a certain set of mechanics and rules. Once you have your game well defined, then you can put story on top of it or whatever. While your games are widely considered more mechanic driven than story driven, and you start from a story, you start from a setting and from a mood. It's well, I, I have. Uh, y I that's the way Deus Ex started. Um, that's the way uh, Epic Mickey. Epic Mickey is an immersive sim. People don't don't see that or don't want to acknowledge that. But in that game, you had to start with you are Mickey Mouse. Um, but shortly after that, you know it, the the world kind of fell into place as uh, a world for forgotten and, and rejected uh, Disney characters and places and things. But the next thing right after that. Uh, was uh, let's let Mickey use what he's made of, ink and paint, uh, to, to uh, interact with the world. So you do very rapidly get to mechanics. I don't want to underestimate the importance of mechanics um, because that is, a, I mean, what players do is what games are, are all about at, at their core. Um, but it's just I... I 
typically what I what I tell my teams is um, I don't want to have to convince a player to be interested in what this game is about. I want I want to find things that players are already interested in. And uh, in Deus Ex, it was, um, uh, you know, cyberpunk was really hot back then. And um, uh, conspiracies were really hot back then. And so I could create a wrapper that would immediately capture people and then thrust them into a world where they get to uh, do things using the systems and the verbs. So I, I often start with that, but... Uh, Thief certainly didn't didn't start with that. It started with um, I, I want to uh, play a game where killing isn't the goal, that uh, sneaking past and not being seen is the goal, uh, which is a very um, systemic sort of way to think about a game. It's a very mechanical way to think about a game. And it implied lots of, uh, of tools that players could use to interact with the AI in the world. Uh, so in that case, the world and the story really did come later. Mm-hmm. Um, same thing with uh, with Underworld. Underworld, we we wa- we started with, um, well, how can we recreate the experience of playing Dungeons and Dragons? <laughs> um, and you're in a dungeon. What do players expect to do? Let's let them do that. Um, so again, that's a more mechanical approach. The uh, the narrative came a little later. But at this point, I'm a big believer in, in having multiple tracks, everything running along in parallel. So um, you need your narrative developed in, uh, at the same time you're developing your, your tools and your systems. Uh, you need the uh, characters and animations and art to support that, that world you're trying to create. So at this point, I would never, never bring in story people or or try to build a story after the game is done that that strikes me as um uh well not a good idea let's just leave it at that not a yeah good i feel like it's a bit of a lack of respect for your players but that's just me uh, talking about game mechanics you have mentioned that something that i also say a lot that uh, any game mechanic is ultimately a verb uh, that you can jump in super mario you can shoot in deus ex and sneak and so forth uh, in our conversation four years ago, in the first time you came to, well, I don't know if you've been any other time, well, when you came to Bilbao four years ago, um, <coughs> we chatted about um, other verbs, not physical verbs like, uh, I don't know, feel or feeling sad or love or whatever, being less uh, uh, prevalent in games because it's really much more difficult to make a mechanic, uh, an interactive experience around something like love than around something like shoot. Do you still think the same four years later? There's been many other games in this uh, while. Yeah, I, I still think that games are built around concrete things, typically. There's something about, um, you know, in games like uh, Last of Us and and others where uh, you you certainly get engaged with uh, the characters more, uh, and there's something really powerful about about this about the power of touch, hmm. uh, even if you can't literally touch another character. But um, yeah, but the feels happen you know, in parallel, right, to the mechanics. They are not the mechanics. Right, right. Hmm. Um, and but there there's something about having to protect something that gives you a different relationship with it. That or with with her or with him, uh, than you get from from my games, for example. But I still think um, the I don't want to say the best games, but the 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 most common games and the ones that I make, frankly, are uh, more about uh, concrete things, things that map well to a button press or a trigger pull uh, or a a mouse click. Mm-hmm. You have uh, in the past I read you, uh, an interview you did. I don't remember where. Uh, where you say that when your looking glass, uh, when looking glass studio closed, that you uh, say that people shouldn't feel that sad because that meant that the, the, there was a l- there were a lot of seeds scattering through the wind 
that would leave a mark in the games industry, making more games as, as the one you guys were doing. Lots, many years have passed since then. Do you think that actually happened? I do, I really do. Um, the most obvious examples of that are the, the work that, uh, that Ken Levine has been doing. Uh, the Bioshock games seem like they, they came right out of the looking glass tradition. A little bit different, but, but still clearly uh, an outgrowth of that. Everything Arcane has done, I love the Arcane guys, uh, but Dishonored uh, and Prey, those, those games are clearly uh, out of that, uh, that tradition. Um, there, there are plenty of others. Uh, the interesting thing to me since Looking Glass closed is that there's been a, a burst of, of creativity and energy in, in basically every kind of game. There are games now that are, uh, that are like Looking Glass games, that are immersive simulations, enough to keep me happy anyway. Um, but there are also uh, amazing cinematic games. Uh, there, are, I mean, there are amazing puzzle games. It's, uh, you know, people ask me all the time, what am I most excited about? Or what do I think the future of games looks like? And what most excites me is not any specific game or any particular type of game, um, but just that it, everything is happening. You know, I mean, who could have seen MOBAs coming? <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't, you know, who could have seen Fortnite ruling the world? Uh, I, I didn't. And it has nothing to do. Those games have nothing to do. Who could have seen Genova Chen, you know? Hmm. Um, so uh, ev everything is happening. And if if you have an idea, there are ways to make that idea, to, to build the game. And there are ways to reach an audience with it. And there are ways to make money on it, even. It, uh, th that so. was, I was about to say that, that every time the business people talk about, uh, the business people from the games industry talk about the future of games, they're like, no, story-driven games are dead because <laughs> premium um, games as a service <laughs> are the future. And then God of War and The Last of Us and Red Dead Redemption. No, but uh, now these uh, subscription games are the future because then you can subscribe for, like, if it was Netflix. And uh, but that never happened. This, it, the, the, the market just grows and grows and includes more people, more models, more kinds of games, more creators. Feels like that that this industry can absorb anything, right? It, it absolutely can. There's a, a screenwriter uh, named William Goldman who said, uh, I'll right. paraphrase, nobody knows anything. Hmm. And it's really true. You can do all the market research you want. I, I, I'm never going to work again when I say this, but I completely ignore market research. I could care less about market research. Um, it, it just tells you what people wanted in the past, not what they want in the future. Yes, exactly. Um, so, uh, but we, there are so many different business models now uh, and so many ways of making money. There are so many genres now, uh, so many clever and creative ideas and developers out there. Um, it, it really just seems like anything is possible in a way that wasn't the case a few years, well, now more like 15 years ago when uh, genres were, were much more rigid uh, and, uh, you know, you kind of had to play by the rules uh, and breaking them ensured that you would be like me, which is kind of the the king of the cult classics. You know, I'm, I'm still waiting for that that breakout hit that sells you know, like Red Dead Redemption numbers or Fortnite numbers. Uh, I, I make, uh, again, I'm never going to work again, but, you know, I make <laughs> the games I want to make the way I want to make them. And yeah. hope there are enough people out there who want it too that I get to make another one. That's really it. I don't know if that makes you feel better, uh, sleep better at night, but um, you might not sell as much as Red Dead Redemption, but there wouldn't be a Red Dead Redemption without your games. Uh you know, there. I'm I'm happy to hear you say that, uh, and maybe it's true. Uh, I will say that. Um, you know, there. I often think about uh, success and what it means. Uh, I think before you go into any project, you need to know um, your definition of success. And some people measure it by maximizing revenue. 
some people measure it by reaching the largest audience. Um, uh, and I certainly want to do both of those. But um, another way of measuring success is um, have you have you advanced the state of the art in any way? Have you done something that that no other game has done before? And I, I try to do that. I, I'm not saying I succeed, but I do try. And uh, another measure of success that, that is important to me, if I can let my ego run wild for a minute, is uh, influence. Mm -hmm. uh, have you done something that, that changes the way players or other developers think about what they do? And, you know, I've, I've, I've had enough developers tell me that uh, because of games I've worked on, they've changed the way they, they do things. They've changed the kinds of games they make. And um, that that may be more than anything. Well, not more than anything, because the thing that makes me proudest is helping other people develop and take the next steps in their careers. That's really what, what it's all about for me. And I, like, I look at, at Harvey Smith, you know, uh, just for one, and look at the success he's had and just think, Hey, we started working together. He was in QA, you know. He was a tester. I can and tell now you, he he's loves running you. studios. <laughs> I can tell you, he loves you. Well, I love him too, you know. <laughs> uh, and and he's not the only one. There are people out there who who uh, have been influenced and have told me they've been influenced by by games like Deus Ex and Underworld and System Shock, mm -hmm. and and that makes me really proud and really happy. I'm running well, out of time. That's a measure of success. I, I, no. I do think that... Come on, that's... we just got started. Yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> but there's one, at, at least one final topic I want to tackle before I, I, I get kicked out of the building. Um, <laughs> I, I don't want you... I don't want to push you into making a political statement, but your games, or many of your games, those X, of course, is the, the most obvious one, carry a very heavy political wave. As, as you say, the cyberpunk was a big thing back then. It's now back in trend and not just because of the huge cyberpunk game. It's it's feels like watching the news. Do you did you approach that trying to um, convey some political thinking? Because there's people I don't fully agree with that statement, but up to some extent that people that say that if you aren't um, giving a political statement, then you are pro statu quo. Either you fight against it or by by default, then you are pro statu quo. How do you approach that when you're writing a game? Do you try to somehow be political or it just happens? Uh, yes, I, I do try to do that to some extent. Um, I think... It, you know, it's a kind of a cliche, but everything is political at some level. Um, the the difference, see, I, I don't, I always try to make a game about something. I want players thinking about, about things, not just wandering aimlessly and killing everything that moves or killing nothing or whatever. That's, that's all well and good. But, um, you know, Deus Ex was about something. Epic Mickey was about something. It was about how important are family and friends to you. Uh, among many other things. It's, I, I always start with a series of questions. What is this game about? Um, the, the big difference is between what I try to do and what, what I think you were, you were saying or asking is I try not to make statements. Um, movies and books and operas and, and even paintings, they make a statement. What you get out of them is... Uh, what the creator believes and your participation in that is um well i agree with that or mm. i disagree with that and that's really all you can do uh games can be built not around statements but around questions um and then we can let players through their their play answer those questions uh so i i did <sighs> There's no way on earth anybody in the world knows what I think is the, hear the air quotes, right ending for Deus Ex. Mm. I'll never say. I do have an opinion about it, but I will never say. I want players to decide for themselves what they think, not just in this silly game, but in the actual world. How do they think the world should be? And, and just to give you an, an example of how that can work, 
uh, I was giving a talk uh, at, at a uh, university, and afterwards, I did something I never do. I, I, some people invited me out from the audience, asked me if I wanted to go get a drink at a bar. And I said, sure. I don't know why I said that, but I said, yeah. And um, Maybe you are after a few <laughs> drinks, a guy who was a little bit tipsy came up to me and said, how could you make that right wing piece of fill in yeah. the blank that was Deus Ex? And before I could answer, someone else walked up and said, right wing, it was, it was left wing from start to finish. And the reality was they were both right because of the way they had played. They got different answers, and they got to decide for themselves. And that's the win. It's like that, games are the, the win for ultimate a performative art. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. That's a, that's a great way to put it. Well, now they are, you know, calling the security guards to kick me out <laughs> because I really <laughs> ran out of time. Just joking. It's been a pleasure talking with you, Warren. Just like every every time that I get the opportunity to talk with you, I feel enlightened and I have a great time. I hope our audience is having uh, as much fun as I do, and I hope you had a good time too. I loved it. I, no, no, no. Don't maybe talk about games, please. <laughs> you know, I just I hope everybody got something out of it and enjoyed uh, listening to us. Best of luck for the months to come. I hope you get the vaccine as soon as possible. Oh, me too. <laughs> and Thanks. see you hopefully next year in Bilbao, if not the year after that. Okay. Stay safe, everybody. Stay safe and healthy. Bye bye, Warren. Such a pleasure bye. to see you again. Thank you.